Genesis 26, 18 tells us Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I am your host, Gene Bailey, and boy, I'm glad you're here today. I know I say that every week, but I really am. I'm glad you're here. Today, you're in for a treat. Today, you're going to meet someone who was there. What do you mean, who was there? I want to introduce to you one of my new friends. Let me just take a moment before I introduce our guest today. You know, uh, social media is a great thing. Television's a wonderful thing. But we have been so blessed by all of you that connect with us on Facebook and through the website and you sign up for updates. One such connection came through Facebook and that's my guest today who has a rich history of revivals. So please welcome Joseph Dowell. Welcome, sir. Thank you, my brother. And what an honor it is to be here with you. Oh, it's an honor for us. Listen, folks, you won't, I, there's no way we can cover the extent of what Mr. Dowell is going to share with us today, but let's talk a little bit of history without taking too much time about your father. You, we were talking back in the back in the green room, getting ready, and you told me about Boots Dowell. Who was Boots Dowell? Boots Dowell came from uh, Paris, Texas, the east part of Texas, as first as a uh, East Texas swing dance band leader and drummer and then to Dixieland Jazz in the 30s, was a drummer for Louis Armstrong for a short period, and then he started his own uh, band, took them to California, and while playing in San Diego, uh, had been there about three years at the Del Coronado Hotel, uh, his, my aunt invited he and my mother to a little Pentecostal church. Okay, before you go any further, so your dad is a drummer and a swing band leader. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yes. And this is in the 30s. Yes. So has was he raised uh, a Christian? Was he raised a believer? My grandfather was a Methodist and my grandmother was a Baptist, but she was a shouting Baptist. A <laughs> shouting Baptist. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but he hadn't been to church in 18 years until my aunt invited him to this little Assembly of God church. And... Uh, it said that the pastor preached hellfire and brimstone so strong he could smell the smoke. Smell the smoke. And mm -hmm. in those days, they had altars in the church, and he and my mother wound up at the altar at both ends. They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, short story, within a year, he went on the evangelistic field. Nobody told him to go to seminary or cemetery or Bible school. He just went. He just got up and went. Now, at the, when he got saved, were you in the picture yet, or were you born after? I think it was just after. You were born. Yes. That was 1940. That was a good year. It was. <laughs> and I was born at Mercy Hospital, which is a support, important because David said his mercies chase us every day. Yeah. And I needed yeah. a lot of it. Yeah, and especially when I was born, I only weighed three and a half pounds, they told me. And I had bronchial pneumonia and four doctors, brother, they gave me my first false prophecy. Yeah. They meant well, but they said I wouldn't live through the night. They said my mother wouldn't live. But an uncle of mine who had faith real faith, right. walked in that Mercy Hospital with, you remember the little Gideon New Testament? Yes, I sure did. He took it out of his pocket and he reached in and put it on my body. He said the Testament was almost as long as I was. And he prayed a prayer and he said, Jesus, you're the great physician. I rebuke this infection in this baby's body. Let him live to declare your works to the nations. Praise God. That was over 7 million miles away go and somewhere around 58 nations. So your, so your dad, who at one time was a drummer for Louis Armstrong, yeah. gives you a little bit of uh, understanding where he came from. Um, and you yourself, you met Louis Armstrong. You were telling yeah, me. Yeah, I was just in New York City. I was actually playing the organ for R.W. Schambach out on North Broadway. And my hotel was downtown. And I walked in out of a coffee shop one night. And right, right next door was a, a bar room. 
and Louis Armstrong come walking out on the sidewalk smoking a cigar. Yeah, and so you were, And you were, I knew who he was because I had his gospel album. Right. And so I said, uh, I'm the son of Boots Dow or, or Buford Dow. He said, Buford who? I said, Boots Dow, because that was his, his name, name right. then. He said, where is Boots Dow at? I said, he's at home in California. He's a preacher. No, I won't tell you what all he said. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he, he said, you tell Boots Dow that, that I said hello and I would love to see a smiling oh, face again. So that was an honor. So, so your dad, he gets saved and filled with the Spirit all yes. at the same time. He was already saved, but he, got, he had an encounter. He actually got saved and received the Holy Ghost the first night. How about that? Yeah, and uh, within a year, sold their beautiful home in La Jolla, bought a 41 Buick, put my mother, my sister, and I in. I slept up in the back window. Right. And uh, that was our motel. They didn't have yeah. motels back then. And he hit the road. And we hit the road. They went 25 or 26 years nonstop. We'd break at Christmas and go home to Grandma and Grandpa's, see the family, hit right back out on the road, tent revivals, auditorium meetings, great revival centers, including the Jack Cole Revival Center right here in Dallas. Right. God was good. Okay, I want you to tell everybody what happened. There's a story about when you were 13 years old, you had... Something specifically happened to you at a Jack Coe meeting. Brother, I had had a dream since I had seen Dima Shikarian's wife at a folk gospel businessman play the Hammond organ. That got in my spirit. And I had taken piano lessons from a Jewish piano teacher, a little 16-year-old boy who was a concert pianist. The second week, he, he took the, if I can borrow this, sure. and I won't do what he did, but he took my music book, threw it on the ground, said, you'll never play anything but the radio. That was my second false prophecy. Within, 30, uh, within a few weeks, attending Jack Coe's day school, or Revival Center day school, uh, he sent me a note and said, Buford, please come to my, uh, my office. So I went to his office, and I'm trying to think, what did I do bad today? Am I right. going to be in trouble? <laughs> you know? And we got in, and he he was a big man. He sat behind his desk and he said, Buford, have a seat. And he said, uh, I need another organist because I'm taking Jimmy Arnold, our organist, on the road for crusades. I need you to play for the church. I said, oh, Brother Cole, I'd love that. But I said, we got a problem. He said, what's that? I don't know how to play. He got up, walked around, said, I'm going to fix that. And he took my little hands and his big hands and he bowed his head and he said, Jesus, teach Buford how to play the organ because I needed an organist for the church. Amen. And he went back and sat down and I'm thinking, that's not a long enough prayer. I need a great big prayer. Because yeah. I kept remembering what the piano teacher had said. Right. You'll never play anything but the radio. Oh, I feel this, brother. Somebody's listening now. They've had some false prophecies. That's right. I agree. And, and you need to put them out of your mind and start listening to what God says. Well, I thought, well, I don't know how to play the organ. And then I remembered Brother Cole had reached up and took hold of a cancer about the size of a half a dollar on a lady's face and pulled it off. And I was sitting from here to that camera from him, and there was nothing but a pink dot. Right. Wow. He jumped off the platform, grabbed a man on the front row, and stood him on his feet. And his back was bent over, brother. I never saw anybody. I thought he would fall on his face. Mm. Brother Cole spun him around and put his knee up in his back and pulled back on his shoulders and screamed, Jesus! And the man let out a yell, and I thought he had killed him. I almost <laughs> fell off my chair. I bet. And the man took off running. He ran clear around that great auditorium. He came back, and his back was as straight as mine is. Mm. Short story. In 30 days, I was playing the organ for the Dallas Revival Center Church. Right here in Dallas. Right here in Dallas. Okay, so you're 13 years old. You've been told you'll never play anything but the radio. And one word from God changed your life. Changed it. But forever. you said something there, and without diverting from the story too much, you really, you made a, you had a statement, you had a word from God, and you attached your faith because of what you saw, you knew what he said was going to come true. That's it. I knew he was a man of God when I saw those miracles. 
So here you are, 13 years old, 1953, basically, yes. and you're, you're playing the organ at 13 years old. What happened? Well, 60 days later, I'm playing under his tent in Washington, D.C. Oh, I wish Obama would. Oh, wait a minute. You're playing in Jack Coe's tent. <laughs> yes. Okay, so now you're on the road. I, well, I was just visiting. I was going through there with my dad, and in, they invited me to play for the meeting. And then I left with my dad in a meeting, and then I wound up with William Branham in, in William uh, Branham. Phoenix, Arizona. Played three revivals for Brother Branham. Uh, it was a very important time because he spoke some things into my life that are coming to pass now. Really? And can I share that with you? Absolutely. We were at a restaurant the last time I saw him. First thing I had in my mind, I was 19 years old, and I wanted to be uh, his business manager. I I had helped some preachers put spots on the radio and some ads in the paper, and I thought I was ready to be a business manager for Brother Branham. But he he helped me out. I, I said, Brother Branham, if you just had the right promotion, meaning me, of course, to help him, that uh, you could have greater crusade crowds than you've ever had. He had been all over the world, and you know the story. He was pivoted to help start the healing revival. Right. And uh, he shook his head, and he said, no, son, that's not the way God planned it. And he bowed his head. And I said, what do you mean? He said, God's through with my ministry. And I almost fell off my chair again. I said, Brother Branham, you're only 50 years old. You, you just come off a deer hunting trip. You're in good health. Why, your ministry could be greater than ever. He said, no, son. He said, God, so let me explain. And he talked about the great healing revivals, the voice of healing, and right. how God had used, and he named William Freeman and, and A. A. Allen, who he had met me in Reverend Allen's meeting. And uh, he named several evangelists, even my father. He had seen him and uh, he said this healing revival is coming to a close a new season will come of the revelation of Christ and the understanding of the Bible like the church hasn't seen since Pentecost and he said then at the end of that season then God is going to raise up true prophets and apostles not non-prophets true prophets and their mind will be the mind of God and their lips and their voice will become the voice and lips of God and whatever God puts in their mind their thoughts they will say it and speak it and it will happen right before them Hmm. and revival thank God for revival is going to sweep the nations and then Jesus is coming back for his church Wow. So you think we're in that place? I believe we're there. I'm hearing reports all over the world. Right. Amazing things of what God is doing. Can I share one real quick? Please, please. A little town, I can't recall it, in Arabia. I think there was less than 4,000 people living there, a village. They gathered together to have a Muslim celebration. They were all in the center of the town. A man came walking into town. Somebody looked up and said, that's Jesus of Christ. Somebody else said, oh, Jesus. A blind man said, where's Jesus? And they took him to him and the man touched him and his eyes came open. Mm. They brought a crippled and he threw his crutches down and began to, and as he went through the city, people were being healed from the right to, I'm not reading out of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. Well, in a way I am because God's still writing the Bible. He's writing it in you and I. We're the tablets. He's writing. And uh, Jesus came through the city. Multitudes were healed. They were falling on their face and worshiping. As he walked out the other end of the town, here came three missionaries. I remember them telling me when I first started the ministry, don't be afraid, Jesus will go before you. And I counted on that. In every crusade I had in the islands and in South America, I said, Jesus, go before me, prepare the way. Well, here came three missionaries. And when they got there, the people were laying on their faces, worshiping. And they asked somebody what's going on, said Jesus was here. Mm. 
and they told them the story. The missionaries stayed and discipled them, prayed for them. Many of them received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. After a few months, they took groups of these people in Saudi Arabia, and I can't recall the town. They took them in groups to other towns to witness, to win souls, to disciple people. And in that part of Saudi Arabia, uh, revival is spreading like fire. Right. It's Praise happening God. right now. Yes. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Glory to God. Thank so you. So, all right. So, let's pick up the story because I don't want to miss. You, you've got such a, a, a rich history. Um, tell me about. So, you're 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 19. Um, I believe that's what you said. You were 19. And you played for William Branham. Tell me a little bit about William Branham. What was he like? Very humble man. Uh, the, the three meetings that I played for him in was in two churches and in a hotel in Tucson. And I saw God do wonderful things. Uh, he was very, pardon the term, laid back. And, and uh, he wasn't trying to impress anybody, just a, a man of prayer. Uh, I was the most impressed when I had that visit with him and he spoke prophetically. He had a prophetic anointing to see into the future of this day. Mm. Can I jump a little bit ahead? Sure. My father was a prophet of God mm. and on his dying bed before the Lord took him home to see, meet his king of kings, he had a visitation from God. He called me to the bedside he said, son, the Lord showed me, you've got a map playing here and I'll just use that as an illustration. It's not the right map, but he said, God is gonna take his finger and draw a line through America. Ladies and gentlemen, in my lifetime, I've never seen America more divided than it is right now. Politically, educational wise, medically, entertainment world, division. And then he said, God is going to take the kingdoms of darkness within each area of society and line it up against the kingdoms of light. But light will destroy the darkness. God. Mm. I've been in 58 nations. I've never seen darkness chase light. Yeah. Never. Well, this room was dark before we came in here, but when they turned these TV lights on, whoosh, right. darkness was gone. That's right. Get ready. Get ready. It's getting ready to happen. It's breaking out all over the world. And in America, we're going to see revival again, real revival. Except this time, brother, I believe man will not take the glory. Jesus will get all the glory. Amen. I agree Hallelujah. with that. Thank I you. agree with that. All right. So tell me about, I keep dipping back into history here. Tell me a little bit about, you mentioned briefly, but you, you had some, you played the organ for A.A. A. Allen some. When I was 17, I uh, actually, Brother Allen was, came to our home in LA right after Christmas and uh, we visited for a week, <coughs> pardon me, and then he invited me to come play the organ for him. He had an organist right from Fort Worth, Brother Jerry McKinnick, a great gospel organist. But he said, Jerry needs to be home with his family more. It's hard for him to travel. and. Uh, so I came to Phoenix with him. They were putting up the old Jack Coe tent that he had bought from Sister Coe after Brother Coe died. Right. That tent was the biggest tent in the world, 240 feet by 440 feet. I'll send you a picture of it. I have one. Good. And uh, uh, he put up the Jack Coe tent. The problem was it had been in a storm and they had to do repairs. So we had a few weeks until the meeting started. And uh, he took me down and showed me property that had been given to him in southern Arizona called Miracle Valley. That's eventually what it became. At that time, it was just a ranch. And that's another story. But we came back to the meeting, and I was going to play for him. And then Jerry called and needed to come back for one more meeting. And they asked me if I would learn how to edit his radio tapes, if they would teach me. I said, I'd love to. So in his house trailer, we took the first bedroom and made it into a radio studio much smaller than what your TV right. studio is. And his associate radio director taught me how to sit at the old reel-to-reel recorders sure. mm -hmm. and edit tapes. 
and cut them down. The programs were 14 and a half minutes, and I had to edit them down, put a closing and ending on it. And I'd do that all day, and Brother, Co Brother uh, Allen would walk in and put a cup of coffee in front of me, and I'd never drink coffee. And so in a few weeks, I was shaking like a leaf. And I called my mother, and I said, Mama, I'm shaking. I can't stop shaking. She said, Son, come home. So I went home. She takes me to her doctor. He said, It's all that caffeine you're drinking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I went back with Brother Allen. And then Jerry came home back to Fort Worth, and I stayed on the road. I was with him eight seasons of my life, one wow. time for three years. I saw miracles after miracles. Tell me the most. I've only got not that long. But tell me one of the miracles that stands out to you from A.A. A. Allen. Wow. Bakersfield, California. <clears throat> the doctors cut a lady open in the hospital to remove cancer in her stomach. When they cut an incision about 10 to 12 inches from right here down, they opened her up and she was full of cancer all of her stomach. They didn't even sew her up. I don't think they could get away with that now, but back then they did. They sent her home to die and said she'd be dead in 24 hours. The ambulance shows up at the back of the tent. The parents didn't take her home. They brought her to Brother Allen's tent meeting at the fairgrounds. An usher comes in and gives Brother Allen a note. There's a lady in an ambulance dying of cancer. He stopped what he was doing, told him to bring the stretcher in. They brought it up the healing ramp, put it on the platform in front of him. She had a nurse with her, and the nurse told Reverend Allen what the condition of her was. Brother Allen dropped to his knees to get ready to pray, and I was sitting over by the organist. I'd actually been setting some meetings up for him. And all of a sudden, he stopped. He said, Brother Dow, bring that preacher with you. I want you to see a miracle. I walked over, and he was kneeling beside this stretcher, much longer than your desk here. And he's told the audience, he said, folks, if this was your mother, your sister, you'd want somebody to touch heaven. He said, put your hand on the seat in front and pray the prayer of faith with me. He started calling out to God, and nobody that I've ever known could pray like Reverend Allen. It was like he, he just put his whole heart and compassion into it. Tears were rolling down his face. And I had stepped back with a brother and I was praying and all of a sudden he's pulling my coat sleeve. And I opened my eyes, he said, look. And we stepped forward, looked over Reverend Allen's shoulder and arm. And that place that was maybe this wide, I'm guessing it's been a lot of years, but I'm gonna say it was an inch and a half to two inches wide in the middle. Mm. And about so long, I watched it over about 45 seconds begin to come together until there was nothing left but a line coming right down the middle of her stomach, a pink line. And I shook my head. I couldn't hardly believe what I was seeing. I'd never seen a creative miracle. Can I be honest? Yes. I ran out of the tent. <laughs> <laughs> I went out behind the tent. I bawled and squalled. I got saved all over again. I renewed all my vows. I asked God to forgive me for everything I'd ever done wrong. And, and then I'm sitting there wiping the tears away, and I heard music, and I heard people singing. And I thought, what in the world's going on? And I ran back in the tent, and Brother Allen had her down off of that stage in front of the platform, and she was dancing in the spirit. I found out later she hadn't even been out of bed in six months. Mm. If you don't have cancer, lay down for six months and see if you can get up and dance. That's right. Two, two weeks later, I'm back in his mobile office giving him some reports on meetings for L.A. and San Francisco. He said, oh, let me show you something, Buford. And he pulled the drawer open and he handed me this big brown envelope. It was a letter from her doctor with x-rays, with tests, saying there's no cancer. It's a miracle Praise of God. God. I never forgot it. Never forgot it. Well, in these last few minutes before we go off there, we didn't, we didn't, I'm going to ask Buford to be back with us on another program, but right now Thank I want you. to take this time with you to talk about healings, miracles, and salvation. Yes. It all goes together. Luke 19.10 says the Son of Man came for one reason, to seek and to save that which was lost. And that is called the greatest miracle of all. 
yes. the, sa the saving of your soul. Yes, yes. So I want you, to, those of you that are regulars and you watch this program, I want you to take it and, and take the link or take a, a copy of the program and show it to your, your loved ones that maybe don't know who Jesus really is and don't yes. understand. Maybe they don't believe in these stories of Branham and Allen and Co. There's so much to be understood, but it all starts with salvation. Thank you, Jesus. So I want to lead you right now in the salvation prayer. Buford and I are in agreement together. Amen. And all that he's done in his life and how God has used him and used his family, that we're coming together and we're agreeing with you as we pray. He said this after me. Heavenly Father, yes, God. <clears throat> ask you, Father, to take me as I am. I believe that you are Jesus Christ, the Son. Yes, God. I ask you to wash me of my sins. I repent and I receive you as Savior and Lord. Precious In God. Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. It's that simple. Now yes, you're a part of the family. Wonderful. Hallelujah. Your adventure is just Praise beginning. God. When we talk to Buford and hear all his stories, it's, it's one adventure after another. Yours is just beginning. Yes. Adventures in faith yes. truly is about to start in your life. Amen. So as we go today, I want you to know if you need some help and you need to know more information, we want to send you a book about your new life in Christ and what Wonderful. that means. All you got to do is write down the information there on the screen. Go to the website, click the link, and we'll get that to you right away. Praise God. Buford, thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. It's good Good stuff. And we're, we're going to keep going. Listen, I'm, I'm excited because on the next program, Buford's going to tell you a story of what Catherine Kuhlman told him yes. backstage. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. We'll see you next week. When I started this journey of learning about revivals, it took a lot of time. I had to look at books. I had to look at videos. I had to scour the Internet. Listen, here the Revival Radio TV team has taken all of that effort out. All you've got to do is go to our website, RevivalRadioTV.com. Here you can contact us, you can watch episodes, you can sign up to be on our email list, and you'll get an email every week about what's happening and special videos. But I want to show you a special feature that's on the website, and that's the timeline. Now on this timeline, you can see it in, th you can see it in 3D, where it looks like that, or you can see it in 2D, and you can actually actually scroll through history of revival. Is that cool? You can go through here and you can see what God did. So let's go here, for instance, uh, <clears throat> right here in, uh, uh, let me see a good one I want to stop. Okay, 1926, Veronaev's Pentecostal Christians of Evangelical Faith First Conference. I can find out more information about what happened in Russia. The Pentecostal leaders gathered in Odessa, Ukraine for an assembly. You know, it is amazing when you start into this, you see how God wove from one revival to the next, how he plucked people out from one part of the world and put them in somewhere else. This is a feature you want to take advantage of. So go to the website, would you? RevivalRadioTV.com. Look on that. Sign up for all the updates that we get and take advantage of this timeline. You won't regret it. Until next time, remember, be the one.